Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Westport Library. I'm Jennifer Keller. I am the programming coordinator here at the library, and I'm super excited to work once again with the UN Association of Southwest Connecticut. Right, that's the name, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would just ask you, for those of you who are in the room with me, to please silence your cell phones at this time. Yes, now we have to remember to do all of that. And even our speaker needs to silence her cell phone. That's great. Uh, we will have a Q&A uh, moment at the end of the program for those of you in, the, in this room. Um, and we will repeat your questions so that the folks at home will be able to hear you as well. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to uh, introduce you to Karen Keyes Marino, who is the organizer of this event. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to say from the United Nations Association of Southwest Connecticut, I would like to thank Jen Keller and the whole library staff for hosting this moving and very timely event on the refugee narrative, specifically focused on women, as it is International Women's Day. Very happy to say. This first presentation is one of many programs that will be ongoing over the next few months about different aspects of the refugee story here and abroad. We hope the UNA Southwest Connecticut Refugee Program will educate, empower, and I hope everyone watching or listening will become engaged with this program and if able to be able to take action to become a part of the refugee narrative here in Connecticut as well as nationally and internationally. So um, we are working on our website. So um, I have that on the end of the um, talk so we can, write, we can tell you all about that after. Um, I wanna introduce, I'm so proud tonight to be talking with this amazing panel that has offered to come. Um, the first, Martine Derte. Martine's in the middle, hello Martine. Hi. Refugee Services Program Manager of CERI, which is Connecticut Institute for Refugees and Immigrants. On the end, Therese Lefauver, Program Manager of the Burroughs Community Center. And I have Andrea Fusino Sanchez, Associate Public Information and Communications Officer of the UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Wait, oh, um, Jim, technical. Oh. Well, that's new. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, just keep I'm talking and I'll just look for ourselves. So. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. I have a lot of voice. Okay. Last fall, when we started to talk about the strategy program internally, and what it could be, we really had no idea about what the ongoing and future world would be like. It's crazy how in these last few months, last few days have changed dramatically. Um, the international emergency in Afghanistan was last August. And now in Ukraine, one of the poorest countries in Europe I found out, with women amongst those the most disadvantaged. As of this morning's count, there were close to 2 million refugees fleeing Ukraine. And that number to me is staggering. It's one of the biggest numbers since World War II that's happened. Thank you very much. Just again, the, the button to the right. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, this image to me caught me. It was uh, people in Poland leaving uh, baby carriages for the Ukrainian people coming in with their babies. We all have probably seen these images. Our TVs and news outlets display the fears of displaced people, bring the horror feel and reality to us every day, and have shown us the desperation, panic, and need to help all these refugees who need assistance and help. Behind each face, though, is a story, an experience, and a hope for a better future for themselves and their families. So, one of the things that we've all sort of asked, or what I've asked myself when I started doing this, 
is what is the difference between a refugee, an immigrant, and an asylum seeker? I mean, I really wasn't clear on that. Um, so I'd like to start with the definition of a refugee. Refugees are people who have fled war, violence, conflict, or persecution, and have crossed an international border to find safety in another country. They often have had to flee with little more than the clothes in their back, leaving behind homes, possessions, and loved ones. Also another important thing is that the effect of climate change is also adding a level of devastating consequences to people around the world in Sub-Saharan Africa and other places. The United States developed in 1951, the 1951 Refugee Convention, which was a legal document and defines refugees as someone who is able to or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or polit political opinion. So what is an immigrant? The United Nations Migration Agency defines a migrant as any person who is moving or has moved across an international border or within a state away from his or her habitual place of residence, regardless of the person's legal status, whether the, whether the movement is voluntary or involuntary, what the causes for the movement are, or what the length of stay is. What is an asylum seeker? An asylum seeker is someone who is, whose request for sanctuary has yet, yet to be processed. Every year, around 1 million people seek asylum. When people flee their own country and seek, seek sanctuary in another country, they apply for asylum, the right to be recognized as a refugee, and receive legal protection and material assistance. Again, working on this project, there are so many facts and figures I could be here for days just talking about it. Um, but I wanted to just sort of give a, a snapshot of what refugees in the world are, world are like. 68% of people displaced come from five countries, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. 1.1 million are new asylum claims in 2020. 48 million are internally displaced around the world. And 50 million are the number of refugees helped by the UNHCR since 1951. These, what I going to show the different pictures of the major camps, the refugee camps that are around the world. First one's from Bangladesh. <laughs> I miss you already. About 85, 850,000 members of the state with Muslim minority are packed into overcrowded displacement camps in many camps in Bangladesh. This was one of the biggest ones the Kudapalong Hulakali expansion site. Many of that started in about 2017. This is in Uganda, the Bitty Bitty Refugee Camp with a population of 232,000 people, 232,000 people. With over 270,000 Southern Sudanese refugees fleeing the ongoing civil war as of early 2017, it was the largest refugee settlement in the world. As of 2018, that distinction was claimed by Kudapalong refugee camp for displaced Rohingya Muslims. This is the Dadal Kikuma refugee camp in Kenya. Right now, they have a ref I think it's about a population of about 400,000. Again, working on numbers is tricky because I tried to bet all my numbers in all of these cases. The next in Jordan. This is the Azraq and Zatari camps. The larger of the two hosts almost 80,000 refugees and is located 10 kilometers north of the east of the North Jordanian city of Morfog. Most of these are just Syrians at this point. Tanzania, more refugee camps, the population 246,000. And Ethiopia, 
three very large camps there also. These numbers are staggering. I mean, they're, when I was doing this and, and thinking of each person, these are families, these are mothers, fathers, children, and it, it almost brought me to tears to read these facts. And it's hard to, to think about this because every person matters and every refugee should have the proper um, clothing, clean water, sanitation. There are lots of things that go into these camps. Some are dressed and some aren't. So why should we care about refugees? I mean, that's a question I think a lot of people have, like, oh, it's all over there. We don't have to worry about it over here. For an American, they're a part of our complex story and history for one. Refugees have had the most basic aspects of life stolen from them, their home. And they just want to have at least some part of that feeling of home to be reintegrated into their current life. Many have been the oppressed or outcast part of society for their whole lives. They only end up being questioned, disregarded, and not cared for. Not one wanted to flee home. Nobody wants to leave their home. Nobody. Being a part of the safety and security of those seeking shelter from around the world is something we should strive for as a country. America should be open to those who want to be good members of society and refugees want to be a part of the story here. You know, we always think about refugees as sort of a, a broad term, but there are many, I was, because it is Women's Day, and I was very happy about this, I was looking at famous women refugees, just to sort of put a, a face on some of these. Um, all very interesting people and all have really contributed a lot to our society. The next part is I'm gonna, I, I was trying to give sort of a rough idea of what refugees and immigrants are around the world. But part of this program is really about refugees at home here in Connecticut, as well as nationally too. And there are lots of questions I had and, and I'm sure the panel's gonna do an excellent job. Coming into Connecticut, um, most of you, this, these are from Afghanistan. Most of you remember these images. Um, how terrifying to leave like this. Um, not knowing where you're going, not knowing what's gonna happen, not knowing the language, leaving all of your possessions behind. Um, and then coming to a new country, you know, you, you, again, the language, just, just to start with that, is pretty daunting to think about what it must be like. But people in Connecticut have really opened their arms, opened their hearts, and even open their pocketbooks to help different people. There have been many, many groups here in Connecticut, um, Catholic Charities, um, IRIS, SERI, um, the UNHCR, Burroughs has done an excellent job. Um, and I wanted to really bring it back home, what refugees, what we're doing to help refugees here. So, our wonderful panel. <laughs> um, let me start with some, some questions. Um, Martine, where, where are most of the refugees coming from that, that you're working with right now? So right now, it's mostly Afghans. During the crisis in the last five months, the Afghans have been the majority of refugees coming in. In our normal years, it has been mostly Congolese, Ethiopia, Sudanese, um, and then in the last two years, a lot more coming in from uh, Latin America. So we were still in Central America. Uh, so it has changed, shifted for us a little bit. We also received in the midst of that Syrians, Iraqis, um, coming from different uh, areas. So, you know, Syrians, as you said, some in Jordan, some are in Lebanon, some are in Turkey. So we are receiving them coming from these different uh, locations, but the majority, our highest population is usually uh, Congolese until now. And Teresa, working with Burroughs, what, um, I know you have a sort of a different, so how are, how are you reaching out 
to find out what the needs are of the refugees and how are they contacting you or how are they contacting them? So the boroughs is, um, is a community center, but sort of not a normal community center. We are uh, sort of program driven. We are more driven by um, the nonprofits in the area and seeing how we can work with other nonprofits to help um, sort of connect agencies and organizations together. Um, and Siri is one of our uh, partners. They have office space in our building, and we also partner with them in programming. And so, um, uh, the Arlington community, which is the items that you see against the window, um, that's a pro one of the programs that we run that trains refugee women to sew, and then we take that out to the market and the money goes back to them to help them become financially secure. Uh, Siri uh, helps us to find women that might want to learn that skill, that might want to be in that program. Uh, Siri also works with us, we, um, and vice versa, with language programs. The Burroughs has two um, classes a day for English, uh, one in the morning and one in the evening. And, um, we work together to, to help those folks who are coming in to get registered for classes and learn English if they're ready to do that. Wonderful. Um, and what about the families? Um, how many people are in these families and how are you? Are you giving them medical, so are there medical needs? Are there, I'm sure there are housing needs. Um, so it really depends on uh, family sizes. So if we are looking at Afghans and Congolese, they are tend to be larger families. So we are looking at uh, generally about six to 10 people in one family. If we are looking for Central American, South American, then it becomes families of three, four, much smaller. Uh, but we tend to receive large families, so we have the capacity to serve larger families, and so we uh, are one of the lucky state and city that is able to afford to bring in larger families. Medical needs, absolutely, a lot. Um, just if we think of, as you said before, what a family has to go through to leave their countries, to leave everything behind, to come here with no clothes, no suitcase, no language, no friends, no family, first hit is mental health. So every family is going to need some support mentally. That is uh, the well-being is the initial issue that everybody's going to need. But then again, we uh, having Yale and having Bridgeport Hospital in our vicinity, this also allows us to take in special medical cases. So we are able to receive cases that perhaps some other agencies are not able to because we have all of these amazing facilities around us. So, uh, you know, it's, it helps definitely. I, when I was um, doing research on this um, project, on this program, and I actually, um, you know, you can sort of get lost on the internet looking for things and you go down rabbit holes. But one of the things I did find was that Yale has a dedicated department just to help refugees, which I had no idea, you know, such a huge hospital. And it was sort of like, so sort of very to have to find it. I reached out to, to some people there, and I hope to actually do another program with them, maybe like a Zoom call. Bridgeport um, Hospital also has Bridgeport a for a mental therapy for youth, for women especially, so as well. <laughs> Andrea, big question. <laughs> um, I know that you know more about the national, um, and I'm sorry. Sorry, Zoom people. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so I know that you uh, probably have more national numbers, or you um, know a little bit more about what happens, you know, um, in a big picture about the refugees coming into the United States. How long does it take for refugees if they're, you know, Afghanistan and um, probably other areas are different, but let's say from Mexico or from uh, Venezuela or from another country, maybe um, DRC, what is the process and how long does it take for people coming into the country, our country? 
So it's a big question that has a big answer, and I'm going to try to, to <laughs> simplify it as much as I can. Um, but there's two main avenues where refugees from asylum seekers can come to the United States. The first is resettlement and the second is asylum seeking. Um, those who are granted asylum and those who are resettled in the United States have two very different processes and have a variety of different nationalities and countries of origin. And I think, um, especially for the United States, the one big uh, process where we think of Mexico and Latin America is the asylum seeking process because a lot of that um, is held at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, but I think a really interesting fact about that situation is the humanitarian crisis at that border um, is, you know, while migrants and refugees and mixed movements are going through Mexico, a lot of the asylum seekers that we encounter are not actually from Mexico. Um, of the 10 countries uh, where asylum seekers, or the 10 countries of origin where asylum seekers are from uh, that we encounter in the United States, five of those countries are in the Western Hemisphere. So we have Venezuela. Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, and Haiti, uh, which I find is uh, an increasingly large um, humanitarian crisis that kind of gets swept under the rug a little bit more than other countries and other um, issues. Um, but then when you have resettlement, that is a whole entirely different process. Um, and that starts at UNHCR country offices around the world. Um, we have 130 offices around the world. Uh, and you know we're very proud to say that even when there's a crisis and an emergency happening, we stay behind and we're there to help um, provide, you know, emergency protection, whether that comes to physical protection, shelter, water, food, relief items, uh, but also in long term. So uh, for resettlement, the U.S. continues to be, per our latest report, the most common destination for refugees. Uh, but that destination and the amount of refugees that we can resettle in the United States is largely determined by the presidential determination number that comes out every fiscal year. Uh, and that determination number decides how many refugees from what location can be resettled in the United States. Uh, so uh, in the fiscal year of 21, uh, the Trump administration was the one to set that number uh, as one of the last things that usually comes out around October. Uh, so in October of 2020, for the fiscal year of 2021, the Trump administration set that resettlement number at 15,000, which was one of the lowest numbers um, that we have had in the United States um, in recent times. And the Biden administration this past October for the fiscal year of 2022 set that number to 1,200 or 1,025,000, ,000, which is a large increase and it's a very good step in the right direction. Um, but we're optimistic that that number will most likely be 65,000 just because of the financial funding and the federal funding that goes into U.S. resettlement programs and programs such as the ones that you are both involved with um, can only financially support comfortably 65,000. So the goal is 125,000 most likely to be 65,000. And it's a large, big, Incredible. complicated question. It is. And it's you asked a beautiful one. Um, how long does it take when? And this is a tricky question. Again, I saw many answers online when I was doing my research. How long does the refugee process take? It can take anywhere from six months to a few years. But it just all depends on the process and the way uh, that a refugee or an asylum seeker comes to the United States. Um, the one thing that I will say about that is the asylum seeking applications continues to increase every year. I think there's 4.4 million applications currently worldwide. Uh, in just 2021, there was over half a million applications for asylum. And the problem with that is that the more asylum cases there are, the larger the backlog is. And so increasing the infrastructure to be able to support a large amount of asylum uh, applications is incredibly important because the more and more asylum cases that you have in the backlog, the longer and longer it'll take uh, for families to be able to find refuge or to have asylum in the United States or around the world. And also for like certain countries, it's harder too. They vet you much longer. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. much harder. And in the United yeah. States, we definitely do vet them as well. Um, and that process takes quite a long time. Teresa, do you have any questions? 
Grace, I have a question for you. I know that um, you work with a lot of women um, from different parts of Africa. Yes. Okay. And um, they may dispute all things. What is the next step to the refugee process? I mean, is there sort of a process that you would have once they have skills? Once they're settled here, is there a way? Um, do you help find jobs for them? Um, outside of girls, I should say. So, I I do want to point out that Fatima, sitting right over here, is one of our artists. Oh. And we're delighted to have her. Fatima is from Eritrea, and um, also, interestingly, I know the vetting process may only be a few years, but Fatima was in a refugee camp for 33 years. Um, and so we tend to think, you know, everybody, all refugees, we lump in one nice little package in our brains. But the women that um, I have a great honor to work with all come from a variety of backgrounds. But Fatima um, has been with our program for uh, two years. And um, so they do go through a training process with sewing, and once they pass their training, they get a sewing machine and we sew at home, um, and then come in once a week to um, to be in the community. The pandemic has sort of blown all of that a little bit crazy, um, but the women want to be together. Um, uh, when I first started a few years ago, uh, most of the women were from um, the Congo. And since then, several of the women have, I mean, many of the women have gotten jobs. Some some are CNAs. Some, um, you know, do Clayton work um, and a, a variety of jobs. One, one works in a hospital. Um, and so... I'm, I'm just always like humbled by their ability to 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 learn skills and to want to work and to want to um, be a part of the community and to to learn other skills. Um, and Fatima right now is in our ling English class because she wants to get a job. <laughs> and so. Um, so the answer to your question, do we help them find jobs? We help them um, when they specifically ask us to help them with resumes, absolutely. If we can help them find contacts or apply for um, applications, do applications, any kinds of those things, absolutely. Um, we help them make any connections that we can. Um, two of the women that were from the Congo just this past year, um, moved to Ohio to um, be with their um, families in other jobs. They have moved out of the area. And I got to say, it's even though you mourn the loss of the women that you've gotten to know and really miss, it's really, that's what should be happening. They should be moving on with their lives and, and um, and building lives of their own here in the United States. So um, it's good to see. Martina, I have another question for you. Um, I'm thinking of the children in education. Um, coming from backgrounds where the culture is totally different, where, I mean, again, language is it's a second language. How, how are they assimilating in schools? Do you work with children in schools? Do you work with educators in the school districts? Yes. Um, before that, I want to say, because it's a woman, it's a feminist, yes, it's a woman. Um, I agree. I think they all work. At least that goes on to the board in what she says. Uh, she helps in every way, in any way. I think she's still humble to say how much she actually helped, but we do know how much she helped, and it's incredible. I mean, from the bottom of our heart, we could have asked you amazing. So thank you. Um, absolutely. So yes, children. Yes, we definitely we have uh, different children programs. Uh, and so when refugees come in, 
there are some required core services that must be provided to everybody within timelines. One of them, of course, is to have every child enrolled in school. So that's the first step. They must be enrolled in school. Children also tend to learn English much faster than adults. Um, but we do have some setups to assist them with it. So we do have a youth coordinator who is absolutely fantastic, who assists all of the children to be acclimated in school, to go through orientations with schools, to meet with the teachers, to be the person of contact for any problem. He meets with the teachers. He, um, you know, sets up all of the appointments that are needed to make sure that all the children are able to go walk with them to school initially or drive them to school. I mean, every effort is being done. Now, within our office, we have some youth programs um, as well. A deep youth program, one of them is, for example, a homework club. So uh, we assist children to come twice a week to come and help with homework in the office. Right now, I'm saying in the office, granted, it hasn't been in the office due to COVID. So we had to work through technology issues and find out different ways. Um, we also set up, we have an Explorers Club. An Explorers Club is a uh, weekend getaway with children where they get to explore a park or go to uh, movies or to the zoo and get to do something that an American would do. And they are surrounded by Americans, so they are able to learn a little bit more about the culture that they are having. We also work with some of the schools that are around us to see about programs after school programs and uh, how to get children together, into, especially if they are from the same culture. So it's how they can be around each other as well. Um, we have programs that serve children from uh, five years old till 24 years old. So also for those that are a little bit older, for all of the changes in school from, you know, from middle school to high school to college, we help them to make sure that they are able to apply. Uh, we have I mean, we have a lot of them in the room. We have so many amazing volunteers uh, that help us as well, whether it is providing transportation to take them everywhere that they need, uh, or whether it is helping them with some very specific homework, or whether it is with English. So English is, of course, one of the, the big necessity that we have. We work with uh, Fairfield University. They bring their students to help out. Uh, and so, you know, it's a learning curve for everybody, but it allows for people in uh, Connecticut to meet refugees, to be more familiar with refugees, and to realize that they're like us. Yeah. There's no difference between our kids and their kids. Uh, and so we try to work constantly uh, finding different ways for children to acclimate themselves. They do have an easier time than parents often because they will find other children their age and of their nationality. We do find a lot of bullying issues in school. That is one of the major issues that we are finding. As they are coming into school, they do not speak the language initially. They are definitely being picked on. So we, our role is to really make sure that the schools are aware that these are refugees, that they need special care and special attention. Um, Again, sorry to interrupt, but that also go back to the mental health of having maybe counselors yes. or something like that. Or just so we are currently uh, working with Bridgeport Hospital in that way to set some art therapy sessions that are for children only. Uh, and we are, we are going to do that with one of these men as well, separate. Uh, but uh, yes, that is definitely a need that we have seen as well. That's and, it. And that's yes. amazing. We have our summer academy. I think Susan here. We have a three uh, weeks program. I don't want to take over. We have a three weeks program as well for the summer that is just for the kids. That is uh, academic, but then also mental, and that is hosted at Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. <laughs> Andrea, I wanted to ask you another question too about um, about refugees overseas. I know that we're trying to keep it internally, but just um, are there. A lot of I know that UNHCR was incredible with going into these camps. I mean, every other photo is that UNHCR is in there. Um, are they too dealing with things like I know it's harder but mental illness because I know it's sort of you know food, water, shelter are probably the basics. Are there other ways that they are helping with that too? 
Yes. Um, we pride ourselves again with our very incredibly talented and skilled field workers. Uh, and we have 130 officers around the world and we, we are there and present at these refugee camps and uh, in other countries where services are needed. Mm -hmm. um, we do have the infrastructure to be able to provide emergency support um, in under 72 hours for about half a million people. But apart from that and long-term goals um, and assistance that we provide includes counseling, includes healthcare, includes access to um, local programs and services. And if we don't have access to local programs and services, advocating for that with governments and stakeholders and partners so that they have an opportunity to not only survive, but to thrive. It's incredible. Um, what we're gonna do is, um, I'm gonna finish this. I'd like to end this part of the program with a poem, and then we'd like to open um, open it up to questions for everybody. Um, it's a poem by John Donne. It was written about 400 years ago. No man is an island, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were, any man's death diminishes me. Because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I want to thank everybody. So, please ask questions if anybody. I'll repeat the questions. <laughs> yes. The, the question, I just would like to repeat it for the Zoom. Um, the question was, do you partner with any other people that work with social justice? I'm sorry. The, oh, the domestic violence or female, female empowerment organization. Yeah. The question is, have you been, have you encountered any people that have been involved with domestic violence issues or if domestic? If they are, yeah, it might be something we can in the part of the town or transitioning to the um, you know, how do you partner with organizations like this? Might say how do you The question is, how do you partner with organizations that will help in cases like that with domestic violence and such? So, so first of all, thank you. Uh, we couldn't do it without the church. Churches, for everybody, they do all of our home setups. We couldn't do home setups. They provide everything that goes inside a home. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, we definitely partner uh, with the Center for Family Justice. They are one of our partners um, and many other organizations that deal with uh, domestic violence. Siri also has a program that is for uh, victims of human trafficking and also for uh, victim for uh, uh, torture program. So we definitely handle this case a lot. They happen overseas and they also happen right here in our backyard. Many of them start in our backyard. Uh, when families arrive and they encounter many difficulties, whether it might be with the language, with the culture, or with not having a job, they start to turn to other ways. Drinking can become involved. And, uh, drugs could become involved and violence becomes a norm in a new home which probably was a home that where there was never violence before we also do have case where violence was coming in we work with 
these cases, we see them quite often. Uh, but we are there, we have ways, we have resources, we definitely have help around, and ourselves, we are also trained in uh, working with uh, violence in the home as well. And whether it's for alcohol or whether it's for drug abuse, we partner with all the agencies that are uh, not only in Bridgeport, but Bridgeport, New Haven uh, as well. Yes. It's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's an executive order, specifically, President so Biden does the right. Right, and then uh, you know, UNHCR works closely with different agencies like DHS, Department of State, uh, the executive office, to make sure that those numbers are uh, appropriate for the crisis and the level of crisis around the world. Um, so I actually printed out this handy handy cheat sheet because um, I there's no way I can memorize all these numbers, but. Um, for the 2022 year, we have, the, or the United States has allocated 40,000 uh, refugees from Africa, 15,000 from East Asia, 10,000 from Europe and Central Asia. I'll put an asterisk next to that because this was prior to obviously the Ukrainian crisis that's ongoing right now and, and developing every day. Um, 35,000 from South Asia and an unallocated reserve of 10,000. So um, there's a very specific reason and details behind each and every single number, um, but 125,000 is such a positive step and an improvement from 15,000. I don't have specific information about that specific refugee camp, but I can take an example from the Matamoros camp uh, that was in across the river from Brownsville, Texas. Uh, that was a cause of uh, the asylum seeking process uh, at the U.S. Mexico border. Um, there was a program called the Migrant Protection Protocols Program, and um, it was put in place by the Trump administration. But one of the casualties from this program is that it caused and created these camps, quote unquote. Um, these settlements on the Mexican-U.S. border where asylum seekers had to remain in Mexico while their asylum cases were heard in the United States. We were able to work with the U.S. government to be able to process these asylum claims and have all the people in the Matamoros camp uh, process into the United States. They went through the vetting process. They went through a COVID check because it was during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and once we were able to safely empty, for lack of a better word, that camp, um, or relocate the remaining persons into safer locations, the government came and basically bulldozed the camp down. So I'm not sure what the context of this specific camp in Kenya is, but I would hope that it would have the same process as the one that we had in Matamoros and being able to execute it, make sure everyone accounted for is safe um, and they have a place to live and, and seek refuge. I think they just, 
I know that today is my birthday. And probably in my my assumption is probably dead at the hardest time to replace. Uh, and, you know, that's what I get in the thought about that. Most people stay in the United States. When they come, they come for a new life, a better life. It takes time, definitely. It can take years for them to adapt, but they very rarely return. One of the reasons why is that once you come as a refugee, you claim that you are not safe in your country. So unless that country is safe again for you to return, you're not allowed to return there. You will put your life in danger. So the United States is their final destination. Uh, most refugees will return home for a vacation that they do once they have their citizenship, because at that point they know that they can come back. And that again depends on what country they are from, because not every country will allow it. Um, as for the most difficult, it is actually, you know, I want, it's very difficult to say that it's the men or it is the woman or that it is the children. The women have it very, very difficult. The women are the ones who are caring for children, but yet they do not know the American system. They do not know the school system. Uh, food, they are used to cook their own food. But a husband that goes out to work and that learns what the American land looks like wants to try all of these different foods and sometimes asks his wife to learn all of this new food. And it creates a lot of tension. The men have the load on their shoulder that they're the breadwinners. They have to come here and they have to work. And if you come here and you don't speak English, you are going to have a job that is going to be at your minimum salary. You're not going to make a lot of money. Now, a lot of people that believe that refugees are poor. Refugees, not all refugees are poor. Some of them have a very, very good life. You get doctors, you, you get chemists, you get scientists, you get actors. You get all sorts of careers that are coming in here, but they're not all able to continue their careers. So we have doctors who are driving Uber, right? This is the only job they are able to know because they don't speak English. So very difficult on the men, but now imagine the wife. The wife has lost all of the good that she used to have in her home. And she tends to stay quiet to protect her family. The woman's role, we see it very often, is to protect her family. She will do everything. She will take the anger of her husband or, or the low income. She will always be there to protect her children. It's actually really difficult. So it's a really tough um, question to answer because it takes time for any refugee to truly, truly make it happen. Uh, and be happy and live the normal life. And again, they shouldn't give up their culture, right? So their culture are still going to stay a part of them. But I, in my opinion, women have it the most difficult. Not all the women are able to work. Not every community will allow for the woman to work. And yet women feel like, I want to help my husband in one way. How do I help him with some income? And they're not always able to making all of these beautiful, beautiful bags and scarves and all that helps them. And it's one way of, they are doing something, they're in the community, it's a therapy way of them. And then there is still that little help that comes where they don't have to ask for their husband for that money. They can do that for themselves or they do have the choice to give it to their husband in most cases. And yeah, I would agree with you. And yes. I think, I think, the one of the most important parts of the Our Woman Community Program is that they come into community once a week. The pandemic really was hard on them because um, it is a way to reconnect with women like you, right? And be in that community. Um, and that was extremely important. I also see that um, folks who are taking our language classes, we will have, um, you know, we'll have a woman come in to register and I'll say, and she'll come in with her husband and I'll say, how long have you been in the country? And it seems like she's been in the country about a week. And he'll say, 10 years. And he's speaking English beautifully and she can't speak a word of English. 
And that's extremely isolating, just extremely isolating. And so um, I agree, there's the husband, yes, workload um, is taken on the shoulder, but the isolation of not knowing the language, not knowing the culture, not having friends, not, uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult. And helping children with school, especially during a pandemic when you, you know, But Siri, I think, did it again. <laughs> Just in case I forget to, I, uh, Martine mentioned your volunteers. Um, and how important they are. And our open community is just completely run by volunteers. Like I'm the pieces around, but um, like Lynn and Deborah who are here tonight um, helping to sell the, the volunteers, you know, do all of the, the major lifting with everything. And that kind of thing couldn't be done without, without them. It's important. Yeah. And I think, honestly, I think People that work at Siri are are superhuman. The the stress that you've been under for the past um, several months is very difficult. Case managers do very difficult work under um, high high tensions, and of course, you want to do the best for families, right? You want to find the best housing, have them have the doctors, be in the right school, and it's hard work. Well. There's a new system that the U.S. government will initiate that um, UNHCR is on the ground and we have border points in Poland, Hungary, Slovenia, and we have humanitarian trucks full of cargo ready to go the minute we know that it's safe um, to get in and go in these passageways. We're providing health care, um, support, immediate relief um, for refugees who are fleeing, um, and for the one million that are internally displaced within Ukraine. Um, but as of any programs to increase that resettlement number, uh, that would be for the U.S. government to decide. And yet, we're here, we're advocating, we're hoping, you know, we're here to help and, and help that happen. Yes, yes. We're in talks daily with NGOs, partners, stakeholders, the U.S. government, governments of different countries in Europe. Um, we have an office in Ukraine, um, and, you know, we have personnel there, we have field staff, and so we're actively working. For that. I'll just add that um, we don't need to increase the number. We can just adjust it within. Uh, as you heard before, there are 10,000 that are left open so far in crisis. So, uh, you know, there's no need to adjust the numbers. They could still come. Just right now, there is nothing in place as of yet. Everybody is asking and everybody wants to help. Right now, it is happening in Europe. In is right there on the ground and helping from all the different countries uh, around the surrounding countries. We are hoping and waiting to see some change. Uh, we definitely do expect to have some Ukrainians come at some point. 
is not going to be the wave of Afghans that we have seen. It is definitely not going to happen that fast. So it will trickle down. Um, it's going to take time. The US has just approved a TPS program, which is the temporary protective status for uh, some Ukrainians, but these are for the Ukrainians that are here in the US. Um, and to be able to give them a status and allow them to stay so that they do not have to go uh, home at this point. But as for refugees, uh, we are still waiting to receive them, which we do expect them to do hope that they will be coming. So they received a different, they're, they're entering under human parole. So they are here for a two year period, uh, in which time the government will look at how to adjust their status. But right now, that has not been identified as of now. So, people are here for So, Refugees uh, are coming in. So when refugees are approved, refugees, their sponsor is the agency, basically the resettlement agency. Um, and they are coming in. Every refugee is able to apply for their residency card at the one year mark and for their citizenship at the five, at the fifth year mark. That is for every refugee. Every refugee is entered the country completely legally. They receive social security upon entrance and a um, employment authorization as well. So yeah, that's the difference. There's a question there. Yes. So um I know you mentioned that the churches um Go into an apartment and um, put it on the furniture and all the little parts that make it look nice and clean and certain things like that. And it seems like it's only happening 
Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's my party. Um, <laughs> um, I think. I think. Uh, does anybody else have any more questions? Um, let me just add one thing. Sorry. Um, one of the um, slides didn't show up at the very end. And it's a resource slide with movies, with documentaries, with books, um, web pages. I'm sorry, we couldn't quite get it to work. Um, we're working on our website, and when we get it up, I'm going to ask if everybody could just go on to unaswct.org, please. Is that correct? And um, we're still sort of working on the last minute changes. And um, so please check back with that, and um, we'll have upcoming events there, and also. Um, Put that resource list up there too. Um, yes, could I just before we end, I have to put in a plug and ask for everybody to look at the beautiful because it directly supports yes. our artists um, and, and they're beautiful things and they make great gifts. And how, if somebody is watching from Zoom and wants to see some of these items, how will they find you? I will show these items to anyone, anytime of day at the Borough Center, or we have a website they can go on to uh, boroughcenter.org and hit the shop OWC and we have uh, products online. Great. Thank you all so much for coming. And for those of you at home, thank you so much for watching. And please, if you can't help another family, please do. You do it too. Thank you.